All right, thanks for watching. And today I wanna to talk about the topology sine curve, which is a very important mathematical object and the prime example of a set that is connected but not path connected. And what it looks like is simply as follows. So it's defined on zero comma one, and it's basically the curve sine of one over x, which oscillates like crazy, except you're just adding the segment here between minus one and one. Okay. So it's this curve plus the straight line segment. And the curvy part, we call it f, and the line segment part, we call it g. So the whole thing, it's called f union g, which again, it's just the set of points x comma sine of one over x, where x is between zero and one, union, uh, just a straight line segment, so zero comma, the interval minus one comma one. And what I wanna show today is that E is connected, but not path connected. And which by the way, it's something I've always wondered about in my life, but now I finally taught analysis. So it was a good uh, opportunity for me to explore this. And by the way, this proof, I, I of course didn't come up with it myself. Uh, I got it from the notes of Brian Conrad from Stanford. And it's an absolutely elegant proof, you'll see. So claim one. Let's show that E is uh, connected. And the first thing to understand is that F itself, so just the curvy part, this is connected because notice between any two finite points, if you want on the curve, it's path connected. There is a continuous way of going from A to B. So really the main thing is where this curve becomes this infinite oscillation in some sense. So notice, so notice F, the curvy part, is connected. Okay. Because it's path connected. So the curvy part is okay. And also, well, uh, the straight line part is also connected. Uh, it's really kind of when you put them together that there's a problem. Moreover, notice something interesting going on. Also, if you take the closure of the curvy part, you get the whole thing because, well, first of all, any points in F are in that closure, but also if you take any point on the straight line segment, well, there is actually a sequence in F that goes to that line set, that point. Just take the, let's say, let's say you wanna go to one half, okay? Just take the set of points, such as sine of one over X is one half, and then you can just converge to that. So it has to do with the fact, if you want, that sine of one over x has an intermediate value property. So the point is, if you just take the set of limits of points in the curvy part, you actually get the whole thing, namely the curvy part plus the um, straight line segment part. So in particular, notice all we really have to show in order to show that E is connected is that whenever you take the closure of a connected set, you get something connected. So if you want claim, namely in general, if F is connected, if you want I'm not sure, I think it's also true for general topological spaces, but think in R2, then the closure is connected. 
So let's prove the claim that if uh, f is connected, then f bar is connected. And first of all, we may assume f is non-empty, because if f is empty, then the result hopefully is trivial to you. And suppose now, therefore by contradiction, suppose f is connected, but f bar is disconnected. Okay. And what this means is we have a separation of f bar. So there are a b non empty open again open relative to f bar and with this that's our disjoint. So a intersect b is empty and a union B is F bar. Okay. So you have to understand. So we have this huge set F bar. Okay. And we know that there's a separation A and B of F bar. So this is A and this is B. Well, in particular, if we have this smaller set f, well, we can just consider the intersection of a with f and with b with f. Essentially, we want to find a contradiction here. So let a prime to be a intersect f and b prime to be b intersect f then very important, so here's the thing, what is the definition of relative openness? It's precisely that. Namely, since A prime is an open set intersect with F, A prime is open in F. And similarly, B prime is open with F. Again, a set is open if you can find, a set is open in F if you can find a set that's open in the ambient space that are with, with such that your set is that set intersect f. And here's very important to understand. Here, in fact, a prime and b prime, they're open, but relative to f. So a prime, b prime are open okay. in f. Because what does relative openness mean? It means precisely that. A prime is open if you can find an open set in the bigger space such that A prime is that open set intersect F. It literally what it means, so A prime and B prime are open in F and moreover you can check that they're disjoint and that their union is F. So and A prime intersect B prime is empty and A prime union B prime is F. Okay. But the problem is F is connected. So we have a contradiction unless one of them is empty. But F is connected. So one of A prime B prime must be empty. Is empty. And without loss of generality, assume it's the second one. So assume B prime is empty, so A prime is F. So without loss of generality, A prime is F and B is empty. All right, and by the way, notice, so what I'm gonna do here seems to make no sense, but it does prove the result. So notice, okay. what, what happens when you go back to your original set A and take the complement? So A complement, which here is relative to F bar, so F bar uh, without A, Remember, uh, A and B were a separation of F bar, so the complement here is just B, which is open. So in particular, A is closed. It 
in f bar. Some, some people call this clopen. It's both, both closed and open. But again, what does relative closeness closed mean? It means that A equals f bar intersects C for some C closed. Closed in your ambient space. So think um, uh, R2 in this case. All right, but then now let's look at all the things. So look at f. But then remember, f was just a prime then. So let's just put everything together. f is a prime, and a prime was, uh, by definition, a intersect f. Okay. But now, a intersect f, well, that's a subset of a. But a is c intersect f bar. And in particular, this is included in C. So F is included in C. So if you take the closure, F bar, that is included in C closure, but C is closed. That's why C closure is C, and that's why F bar is included in C. In other words, C is not such a huge set, actually. So f bar is included in C. And in particular, what is A? That's kind of interesting. A is C intersect f bar. But remember, f bar um, is smaller than C. So if you take the intersection, which is the smallest one of them two, it, you just get f bar. And therefore, in particular, what is B? I mean, we're already have a contradiction, but just to make it clear, b is f bar without a, and that's f bar without f bar, and that's empty. But that contradicts the fact that both a and b, again, in the bigger space, were uh, non-empty, because, again, we had a separation, if you want. And that's why uh, we do get a contradiction, and that's why uh, your space is connected. So that's the proof of connectedness. And now let's prove that it's not path connected, which uh, is more analytical, but I think it's, in my opinion, way more interesting. So, all right, and now let's prove the more interesting part, namely that the uh, topology sine curve is not path connected. So claim E is not path connected. Well, suppose not, meaning that it is not not path connected. So suppose it is path connected, then in particular what you can do, you can find some curve that starts here in F and that ends at the point zero one. Okay, so again, suppose not. then there is a path, again a path is just a continuous function from 0, 1 to E with initially it's an F and uh, gamma 1 is in 0, comma 1. And now let's just use continuity. So remember, a path is continuous. In particular, it is continuous at 1. So since gamma is continuous at t equals 1, and here, just use a definition of continuity with epsilon is 1 half. What we know is there is some delta such that if t minus 1 is less than delta, and in fact, by choosing delta even smaller, assume t minus 1 is less than or equal to delta, but uh, gamma t minus 0, 1 is less than 1 half. And 
couple of remarks. So first of all, remember t is actually between 0 and 1. So this is actually equivalent to saying t is between 1 minus delta and 1. We'll need this in a second. And also, well, um, if gamma is just on this segment the whole time, it's kind of boring and it contradicts the fact that we have a gamma zero is an F. And in particular, it is actually okay to assume that there's some points between one minus delta and one that are outside of the line segment. So there's some points outside here. And now, what is our strategy? Our strategy is as follows. Namely, continuity means that for basically t close to 1, all the gammas are in that little ball of radius 1 half. But that can't be, because there are points here where uh, gamma is uh, minus 1, where the height at least is minus 1. And that's a contradiction. So really what we're looking at, and you'll see why in a second, uh, we're looking at points where sine of 1 over x is minus 1. And those are very, very important. Now, just a couple of uh, formalisms, if you want. Uh, so first of all, consider again gamma of 1 minus delta. That's what we want to focus at, and that's just called x naught y naught. So consider this point here, okay, which is x naught y naught. And as I said, assume that this point is on f. So it's okay to assume that x naught is positive. And then I can look at gamma of t, and let's just write their components as follows. Then we have gamma of t, that's gamma 1 of t and gamma 2 of t. Well, by definition, gamma is continuous. So the first component is continuous. It's continuous. And in particular, it has the intermediate value property. So it's continuous on uh, 1 minus delta and 1. And what it means is that um, for all the values between gamma of 1 minus delta and 1, so let's say this is gamma, for all the values between its initial value and its final value, uh, there is some point that attains that certain value. So uh, more precisely, this means that um, for all, uh, uh, x1 between, so gamma, let's say, of 1, which is by definition, gamma 1 of 1, which by definition is 0, because the first component is 0, uh, 0 and gamma 1 of uh, 1 minus delta, okay, which here is x0. So for x1 between uh, 0 and x0, so in the interval 0 comma x0, there is some t t uh, between uh, my 1 minus delta and 1. So in particular, what we have t minus 1 is less than or equal to delta, which is important, such that such that gamma 1 of t is x1. And uh, in particular, what we get, we then get that uh, gamma of t gamma of t just becomes x1 and sine of 1 over x1. And now essentially what we want to do, we want to um, find an x1 such that this is minus 1. And in part, in more precisely, let uh, x1 
Now, again, we, could, we are allowed to choose x1 as long as it's between 0 and x0. And so now let x1 be 2 pi n minus pi over 2. And that is in 0 comma x0 if n is large. Because this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. But then, again, gamma of t, that is x1, sine of 1 over x1, and in particular this becomes sine of 2 pi n minus pi over 2. But that's the same thing as sine of minus pi over 2, and that's uh, x1 comma minus 1, which is the same thing as 1 over 2 pi n minus pi over 2 comma minus 1. And we have this concrete formula. In particular, we now get a contradiction because even though t minus 1 is less than delta, we actually get that gamma of t minus 0 comma 1 is not less than 1 half. But uh, if you want gamma of t minus 0 comma 1, that becomes, again, 1 over 2 pi n minus pi over 2, and then comma minus 1 minus 0 comma 1. And by the way, absolute value here it just means length in R2. And that just becomes da, 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 1 over 2 pi n minus pi over 2 and then minus 2. But then what is absolute value that is just the square root of the sum of squares? 1 over 2 pi n minus pi over 2 squared plus 4 and that's greater or equal to square root of 4 and that's 2 but how in the world could this be less than 1 half? No way. Something greater or equal to 2 cannot be less than 1 half and that's a contradiction. So in fact this gamma uh, cannot be continuous in some sense if you uh, require it to satisfy all those things. And that's why we actually get that this uh, set, the topologist sine curve, is not path connected. How cool is that? And again, thank you again, I think, Brian Conrad for those amazing notes. They, I think the proof is especially elegant. Um, all right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.